Gattaca is the class favorite, hands down. It's a brilliant example of filmmaking and has stood the test of time and influenced generations of filmmakers, students, and scholars. It has also been used to create discussions about the future of reproductive technologies like human genetic engineering and human cloning among scientists and bioethicists. The film represents cinematic storytelling at its very best. It tells the tale of two brothers born into the not-too-distant future. The older brother is named Vincent, and he is born the natural way. His younger brother Anton is born through genetic engineering. The first part of the film shows them growing up together in a middle-class house with a mom and dad straight out of the 1950s. The two brothers are fond of playing chicken, and when their parents aren't looking, they race out to the ocean horizon. Anton always wins because the genetic engineering has given him a bigger body with more muscle mass. The much smaller Vincent collapses early on in the race and has become accustomed to losing. The race between the two boys perfectly embodies the struggle between the valids and the invalids in the future outlined by the film. The cards have been stacked against normal people that are derided by nicknames like Faith Birth, Godchild, and Degenerates. The film starts with Vincent as an adult, where he has secured employment as a navigator first class with a private aerospace organization called Gattaca. His job there is to lead a mission to Titan, and we see him in the final days before blast-off. Unfortunately, an unexpected murder at the organization has filled the workplace with federal officers trying to solve the case. Vincent is also a criminal. He is impersonating a valid named Jerome Morrow, whose genetic profile is exceptional even by Gattaca's high standards. Vincent? From an early age, I came to think of Vincent? myself as others thought of me, Vincent? chronically ill. The film goes into a flashback that illustrates his childhood filled with discrimination and emotional distress. In one scene, Vincent is denied access to preschool because a blood test given at birth indicated he had a bad heart. The birth scene at the hospital is provocative because we don't know if the testing is voluntary or mandatory. In any event, it suggests that every individual's life is mapped out at the time of their birth, creating a super rigid class system built on blood and genetic analysis. 99% probability, early fatal potential, life expectancy, 30.2 years. Vincent hits his head on this genetic glass ceiling repeatedly, first in the swimming scene, second when he is denied access to preschool, and third when he is disqualified at a job interview. However, he does have a stroke of luck by winning the second swimming race shown in the film against his genetically engineered younger brother Anton. Something was very different about that day. Every time Anton tried to pull away, he found me right beside him. Until finally, the impossible happened. Vincent! Vincent! It was the one moment in our lives that my brother was not as strong as he believed, and I was not as weak. Mystified by this surprise win, Vincent gets an insight into his situation and comes to understand that the blood predictions are not foolproof. Armed with this new knowledge, he leaves the family home and strikes out on his own. With a compromised genetic profile, the only job Vincent can get is as a janitor. But fate intervenes again and he gets sent to Gattaca. While mopping their floors and wiping their windows, he is made aware of an underground service available to ambitious invalids. Right. 
he reaches out to a genetic broker that hooks him up with Jerome Eugene Morrow. He's down on his luck after being paralyzed in a suicide attempt by stepping in front of a car. He has run out of money and is looking to cash in on his genetically enhanced body by selling it illegally on the black market. The two men enter into a fraudulent relationship where Vincent pretends to be Jerome by fooling biological gatekeepers with his blood and urine samples. He applies for a job at Gattaca as Jerome and breezes through the genetic screening. After that, the dynamic duo maintains their deception by manufacturing a composite person that is half Vincent and half Jerome. In effect, both men lose their identity to thwart a biologically oppressive system in which neither can advance by being who they really are. There are some very strange oversights to the story. First, it makes no sense that Vincent would have to go through the fingertip turnstile every day from the initial screening at the interview. The security feature is most certainly used to exaggerate the threat of detection, so we can chalk that up to artistic license. Second, how could Vincent manage to fill the specimen cup with urine by using an obvious catheter? Later on, Dr. Lamar admits to helping perpetuate his fraud, but the first instance of deception would certainly not go undeclared. In any event, Vincent does successfully infiltrate the Gattaca defenses, enough to fool his peers and even start a romantic relationship with a co-worker named Irene. In one tense moment, Vincent's deception is nearly exposed by an eyelash left in a corridor and his real ID splashes across his computer station. His boss leans over to check his celestial calculations and gauge his reaction to the electronic bulletin, suggesting that he has become suspicious. Of course, there's not much he can do given the fact that he is attempting to conceal his own crime of murder. Gattaca is a cat and mouse chase between the FBI, Vincent, and Jerome. The surprise twist is the lead detective on the murder case is Vincent's younger brother, Anton. He is shocked to find that his older brother is not only still alive, but lingering about Gattaca as an employee. His first suspicions are to link him to the murder, and he becomes the prime suspect. During the investigation, however, Anton lies about his connection to his brother to the other detective, and obviously covers up evidence of their parents' existence. Everyone seems to be compromised in some fashion, suggesting that the future requires stealth, manipulation, violence, murder, and subterfuge just to survive. And then there's the matter of suicide. Jerome ends up in a wheelchair after falling into a terrible depression when he only scores a silver medal in swimming at the Olympics. Spiritually broken, he attempts suicide by stepping in front of a car only to end up paralyzed. Vincent explains that he won the race against Anton because he never saved anything for the swim back indicating that it was also a suicide attempt of sorts. The second suicide attempt happens in the last race he swims, where he explains his perilous strategy to a dumbfounded Anton. Let's pause for some reflection. How did Vincent survive the two swim races? If he did swim past his upper limit, then he should have drowned before reaching shore. Instead, he had enough energy to swim back and carry the unconscious body of his younger brother. The math just doesn't add up, suggesting this analysis is missing something larger than the race itself. In the scene of Vincent's birth, his mother is shown holding a rosary, suggesting that she is praying for his birth and good health. Although religion is not obviously foregrounded in the film, it is referenced in the background. For instance, the derogatory slang for non-genetically engineered persons is both faith birth and God child, indicating they are tied backwards to a moral order grounded in religion. By comparison, the valids are tied to a new system determined not by God, but by technology. In the last swim race between Vincent and Anton, they approach a critical point of no return. Anton cries out to Vincent that they've gone too far and should begin their return. Vincent's response is somewhat cryptic, stating that it would be easier to swim to the other side. What other side, I wonder, is he talking about? There's no reason to assume the ocean is not the Pacific, suggesting the closest possible other side is Catalina Island. 
If you started from Huntington Beach, the swimming distance would be 30 miles, making the total swim out and back 60 miles. A marathon swim is generally about 6 miles, making the total distance outlined in the film a veritable death sentence, unless Vincent's description was not meant to be taken literally, but metaphorically. The other side can be referencing the transition from life to death, as in, an angel stood before my prone body and took my soul to the other side. Vincent was at the end of the line and his character verbalized his plight metaphorically. I am at the edge of death, closer now to the other side. At this point, Anton again sinks back beneath the waves and Vincent fishes him up from death and continues back to shore with his body in tow. He looks up to the night sky and the clouds part to reveal the heavenly firmament, indicating he has been the recipient of a miracle. God reached down to give strength to the God child and spare his life and that of his brother. Let's apply our new insight to help understand the end of the film. I have never liked Anton's final suicide and have come to regard it as a flaw in a virtually perfect film. At the beginning of the film, it is stated that Jerome's genetic engineering is so powerful that he will practically live forever. How long is practically forever? If Gattaca is a religious allegory, then it's difficult to know exactly which elements are supposed to be read as metaphors. If Jerome is viewed strictly as a human being, then he must have a biological end. However, if he represents a metaphor for science, then he could live practically forever. The writer-director of Gattaca is Andrew Nicole, and he has discussed the use of symbols embedded in the film. For instance, the name Jerome Eugene Morrow is an anagram for Man of Tomorrow. If this is true, then Jerome represents an idea that can actually go on to live practically forever. However, the character, played by Jude Law, does crawl into the home incinerator unit and flip the switch. His character has one of the most interesting arcs in the story. When we see him at the beginning of the film, he is truly a broken and self-destructive man. But towards the end, he seems rehabilitated by his experience with Vincent and his dreams of spaceflight. He has a very playful character and is certainly capable of both wit and irony. Let's assume he has a thousand year lifespan. That's a ton of time to extinguish by suicide. Let's assume his interest in reading makes him a gifted writer too. It's not too hard to imagine a scenario in which his meteoric rise to the top as an Olympic medalist is juxtaposed to his fall into paralysis, alcoholism, and despair, and he writes a tell-all book that reaches across the divided social spheres of valids and invalids and demonstrate how they are better off working together. Human beings have a propensity for thinking in binary terms like good and bad, hot and cold, dark and light, wet and dry. Vincent is most frequently described as an invalid, but he is also despaired as a faith birth and God child. If these are terms used to describe persons not genetically engineered, what might be an extension of terms for those individuals that are genetically engineered? Here is a list of antonyms for faith listed at dictionary.com. Unbelief, denial, treachery, doubt, and agnosticism. Here is a list of antonyms for God. Irreligious, insincere, mortal, inferior. If you take the process literally, then the opposite of faith can be denial or doubt, 
and the opposite of God can be treachery or irreligious. One step further and we can reconstruct faith birth to mean people who believe in God and God child to mean the children of God. The opposites that are suggested describe the valid population who are described as people who have no faith and people who are inferior. If we take the most extreme polar opposites from a Christian perspective, then the opposite of a faith birth is a faithless birth, and the opposite of a God child is a devil child. At the end of the film, the storyline crosscuts between the flames of Vincent's rocket ship and the incinerator tube flames cremating Jerome's body. It's striking, beautiful, and compelling. But what does it mean in the context of a religious allegory? If Vincent is the godchild, then the rocket can be read as a metaphor for him going to heaven. And conversely, if Jerome is the devil child, then the incinerator symbolizes him going to hell. The following paragraph is from the Center for Genetics and Society, a nonprofit organization working to encourage responsible uses and effective governance of human genetic and assisted reproductive technologies. Quote, Religious perspectives on human biotechnologies vary widely, depending in part on the specific technology or application. Most religious leaders are in step with public sentiment in opposing human inheritable genetic modification and reproductive cloning, and recognize social and ethical as well as theological objections to them. In 1983, a coalition of U.S. religious leaders issued a letter to Congress calling for a ban on inheritable genetic modification. Religious communities are more divided about research involving human embryos, with many conservative Christian denominations opposing embryonic stem cell research. Communities of faith may ground their approach to human biotechnologies in theological beliefs, but their concerns also shed important life on the potential for human biotechnologies to redefine our understanding of life itself. Here is an abstract from the Human Genome Project and the Catholic Church authored by Albert S. Moroseski, 1991. Quote, The Catholic Church has not made any formal statements about the Human Genome Project as such, but the present Pope, John Paul II, has commented, albeit very briefly, on various aspects of genetic manipulation. Genetic interventions which are therapeutic, namely directed to the correction of amelioration of a disorder, are acceptable in principle, provided they promote the personal well-being of the individual being so treated. Genetic interventions not therapeutic for these specific individuals, but are experimental and directed primarily to improving humans as biological entities, are of dubious moral probity but are not necessarily to be rejected out of hand. To be morally acceptable, such genetic intervention should meet certain conditions, which include due respect for the given psychological nature of each individual human being. In addition, no harm should be inflicted on the process of human generations, and the fundamental design should not be altered. Any genetic manipulation that results in or tends to the creation of groups with different qualities such that there would result a fresh marginalization of these people must be avoided. It has been also suggested by a few that because the Son of God took on a human nature in Jesus Christ, one may not so alter the human genome that a new distinct species would be created." Unquote. Let's take the last line from the quote and apply it to the film Gattaca. Quote, It has been also suggested by a few that because the Son of God took on human nature in Jesus Christ, one may not so alter the human genome that a new distinct species would be created. Unquote. The idea of creating a separate species of humans 
definitely describes the divide between the invalids and the valids featured in the film. Also, if the genetic corpus of Christ is conceived as a genetic thread between humans and Jesus, then genetically altered persons would also have lost their divine connection to God. From this perspective, the valids are both a new branch of human beings, but also a lost tribe to God. The reasoning sets down a theological case to conceive the genetic manipulation of human genomes as synonymous to an unholy branch of persons, a thesis that matches up with the moral reasoning set out in the film Gattaca. How do these same themes play out from a secular perspective? If we start from the point of view of evolution, then human beings have evolved over many eons, starting from single-celled organisms that have evolved in ever more complicated ways, ultimately producing the vast spectrum of biological diversity found on the planet today as a result of mutations within species. The genetic inheritance of Homo sapiens is therefore not theologically determined, but biologically determined, natural rather than supernatural. Science has cracked the code of human genome, and that information affords us remedies to human sickness not available to past generations. Given this framework, why wouldn't we take advantage of the promises these therapies have to offer? In conclusion, the film Gattaca presents a dark future with rampant oppression, genetic discrimination, murder, and suicide as if it's a foregone conclusion should humanity take the path of human genetic engineering. However, this bleak future is largely fueled by theological conclusions about human sanctity, the corporeality of Jesus and our bodily connection to God that stands outside the biological world described by science and evolution. Gattaca is a belief-driven narrative that visualizes a bleak, spiritually dead world controlled by atheistic robots manufactured by genomic companies because it fears a future not controlled by theological scripture.